G'day everybody, welcome to today's episode of Let's Do Another Take. In today's podcast, I'm speaking with the amazing William Bowden. William Bowden is a Grammy Award winning mastering engineer on top of the countless areas that he would have won. Um, I didn't even ask him about them because there was a Grammy involved. But uh, Willie is just an amazing mastering engineer. He is as good as anyone in the world. And we chatted about loads of really cool stuff. So please sit back and relax and enjoy my chat with my dear friend, the amazing William Bowden. For those of, of us that don't know what a mastering engineer does... Are you able to give us a synopsis of, of what mastering is and, and how you approach it? Sure. Um, in many ways, depending on your audience, I guess, but the, the easiest way is to sort of use an analogy. Uh, and the analogy that I sometimes use, especially when I'm dealing with, as I often do with people who work in imports, shipping, uh, offices, you know, government departments, um, what I do is the equivalent of French polishing. So somebody brings me a rough hewn piece of furniture and I either give it a super fine polish, maybe I keep it pretty rough, but I polish a couple of things. Maybe I don't polish much of it at all. Um, but it, in a similar way, uh, a mixing engineer and a recording engineer, which is often the same thing these days, they work in a studio, they mix a band, they, uh, they generate a mix of the song and then they give it to me and they say, do you think... Mr. Smarty Pants, you can make it sound any better. <laughs> and strangely enough, I have the, uh, the spuds to say, apparently I think <laughs> I do. And so somehow I've survived by polishing other people's mixes um, for, uh, well, I started when, when I, at the record company when I was 23. So I'm, I've just turned 56, alarmingly. Wow. Uh, so 23 years, is that right? No. Uh, 30, 30, 33, three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you can see maths, <laughs> funny enough, my father is a mathematician, but it just didn't really wear off on me. <laughs> <laughs> so 33 years of doing it. Oh my God, it's incredible. It feels like five minutes, you know. Are really you still does. in love with that? Yeah, yeah. I, look, I look forward to every day. And to be honest, there's always a different challenge. I never, never quite know what I'm going to get. Mm. Um yeah, it's and I'm I'm always learning things like uh, I mean even today, so I've done a couple of singles for uh, Ella and Sienna, a country band that Matt Fell's been producing, mm -hmm. a duo I suppose you could say, mm. and um, and they sent me the third single and I thought yeah you know I had listened to the other two and thought ah, you know I've just got this feeling, <laughs> and so I kind of just went for it again and came up with something different and sent it to them and said, look, you know, I can always go back to, you know, what we sort of had. The other two were re reasonably consistent. Mm. But I've just got this sort of feeling that I think I might have kind of cracked the nut, maybe a bit late, but, you know. <laughs> and, um, and they were like, ah, oh, yeah, just, you know. And, and, and so I've got an EP of theirs to do. So I get to redo everything anyway. Nice. And, um, yeah, so, you know, it's like in some ways, you know, you can't say, you miss smart Mr. Smarty Pants because you know sometimes you get things right after a couple of goes you know I mean most mostly what used to happen was I had to get it all right on the first go but now I tend to get a bit more time with projects and I can experiment and I don't have to have the client sitting there going mm. you know why isn't it working uh, mm. and so that that's been a benefit for me from coming down to Tasmania and working on my own is that I've been able to experiment so crazily that I've mm. actually taught myself a hell of a lot of things. That's unreal. I think a lot of people probably think that when you get to your level of, let's, shall we say, success, that, uh, that <laughs> you you're probably know everything. just, yeah, you know everything and you're, and you're not learning all the time. But I know from our regular chats that, you know, we're always learning and always trying to get better, right? Well, I think so. I mean, to, to me, 
like most of the musicians that I know, they don't sort of get up to a certain level on their instrument and then just go, right, that's it. I've yeah, made yeah. it. You know, yeah. bang, yeah. don't even have to practice anymore. I'm unreal. Or mm. like, you know, if you're talking to your, your local average spare part surgeon, maybe even a brain surgeon, say, yeah, when did you finish up your training then, matey? And they go, oh, yeah. well, in the 80s, you know, it was great back then. We used hacksaws. And you're yeah. just like, wow. You know, yeah. it, it's not even just a case of, I mean, you, you, you can stay up to date. Obviously, in your world, you know, there are so many different plugins, you know, just tons of things. Um, I mean, there are, I guess, in my world, it's a little bit, it's funny, though. I often think that my world is a bit more like the world of sort of these watchmakers where, you know, you can use a particular, particular you know, Bergeon screwdriver or you can use another one. But at some point, you're kind of using generally the same stuff. And mm. it, I used to change gear all the time, experiment. You know, I always thought there was some magic compressor or something that was just going to, wow, you know. Mm. And in the end, I, I actually went sort of, I mean, you, you know, I don't know if you can if you're able to see it very well. I'm on a bit of a tight leash with the damn yeah. Yeah. thing. But, you know, that. Oh, is, is it all right to do it that way? <laughs> it, it, sure, it's sideways, but sure. Yeah. And this is well, anyway. this is not going to be perfect for the audio component of the podcast, but no, sorry about. It. Well, yeah, but um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, yeah, it, I, I have I have things that I use, uh, you know. Okay, so here, here's an example of of you know I I was given a brilliant uh, experience in that kind of thinking really early on. I didn't learn enough from it. I ignored it. I went away from it, and then I came back to it. So my friend Dale, Dale Noy, one of the first first guys I ever worked with, still work with him. This was before mastering. So this was when I was recording in studios and mixing, which is where right. I started. Yeah. He had a Roland JX3P, and it was a pretty simple two-voice, um, two-oscillator synth. Mm. Um, I think it was, was it four or six polyphonic? Could have been eight. Not sure. Anyway, um, and I'd had that synth. My, well, my brother had really had it, but we played around with it, and we sort of concluded that, yeah, you can't really get that much great stuff out of it. You know, we wanted a Prophet 5, which is was only five voice, but it was an amazing synth. Mm. And um, and then, you know, a couple of years later, after it's been sold or whatever, I'm working in the studio with Dale, and he's got, he's got a um, JX3P, and he's pulling sounds out of it like you wouldn't believe. Mm. And I, I just was so humbled. It was like, you know, the the big mistake I made, it, it's like, don't blame the goddamn tools. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's your first mistake. <laughs> but having said that, I was at the record company. So, you know, I worked in a studio and then I ended up at a record company cutting vinyl and, and doing CD mastering. And then when I got out of the record company, which was after 13 years of hard labor, I wanted to buy everything because the record company would almost never buy you anything new. So I had all right? this, yeah, I had the, oh, I had all this built up uh, sort of tension <laughs> mm. and pressure about, I want new toys. You've never let me have them. And, <laughs> and this um, is back in the day when record companies had budgets. Well, but Festival was always a bit of an unusual company. Um, right. It wasn't, it was a company where it had a sort of a slightly, I would say, boutique-y, local arm but mm -hmm. mainly it let mushroom make all the creative decisions and festival had the license to um you know ireland a and m chrysalis like big labels and so it made a lot of money and then slowly those labels left festival and had their own distribution or they ended up in another deal with someone like perhaps universal or polygram or something mm. i can't really remember but um yeah so festival was making money but it was shrinking and I came into an environment where most of the people who worked there were used to just cutting product that was already mastered from overseas and just simply cutting it to vinyl and making a good copy. And that's, that's how we all started. It was like, right. whatever this is, get as, as best a copy of it onto the vinyl as possible. Hmm. Now, you would think in some ways, oh, well, that sounds easy. Just do the minimal amount, <laughs> but you'd be wrong <laughs> because vinyl was so fussy. Mm. And so somebody whose sibilance to your ear 
when you heard it not coming off the vinyl, sounded just the same as the next guy. Hmm. And you'd cut it and it'd be like, and you'd go, oh, fuck, you know. Hmm. Um, or trying to get records loud. And then somebody would always bring in something from overseas and go, you know, this is a new Prodigy record. You know, why can't we have it this loud? I don't mm. know why they're English. Maybe because they brought it back the on prodigy. the plane. Yeah. Um, so, so what we do is all sorts of experimentation. Um, there was another guy there. Rick O'Neill, he was into experimentation and I was into experimentation. Mm. And so we do crazy things like run extra helium on the cutter head so it wouldn't explode because if the cutter head blew, it had to go back to Germany. It cost oh. 10 grand what? and uh, you had to wait, I think, three months. So we were basically told, whatever you do, never blow a cutter head. So, so Festival cut quite conservative vinyl up until the arrival of these two young idiots who were like, we've got to make... We've got to make some noise. <laughs> <laughs> and because over the road we had 301 who already had the loudest cuts. I mean, some of the loudest cuts in the world. Right. Some of the best mastering engineers. You know, they were, they were famous. They were just hooning in the 80s uh, mm. and I guess in the 90s to some degree as well. Mm. And so we were like, who's ever heard of Festival? Um, but eventually, look, I, I, I just persevered and the record company work vanished or there was very little of it. And I ended up just working with clients, like freelance clients who came in the door. Mm. And so career-wise for me, that was how I built some sort of client base. And, and Festival loved me because it was like, somehow this guy's bringing in money from strangers mm. into the door and where, where we thought all that was closing. <laughs> wow, okay. So, so that's how I stayed there for so long i mm. mean they, they they did a a very funny thing once which was the new management came in you know they they sold off they got rid of the old guys who were making money by the way mm. got in new guys who cost them a fortune but were able to go to the murdochs and say give us more money mm. and everyone in the company had to go through their um write their own job description have an interview with their boss blah 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 there were two people in the company who were told you don't have to bother with that the electrician and me. Wow! <laughs> and it was, and I should have asked for a pay rise that day, Michael. But I was so fucking naive. <laughs> I just thought, oh great, I don't have to do that stupid thing. Yeah. That's all I thought. That's wow. That's how stupid I was, you know. But. And how um, long? How long were you at festival? Thirteen years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Eighty. Uh, well, I finished in November two thousand and one, and I started in March eighty. I think it's eighty. Eight or eight, 88, I think. Wow. Yeah. Um, yeah, but when I first got there, there was an old room that was very 70s. It was all wood. It had kind of these gold drapes around it. Wow. It was designed for quad. Right. Um, it had wow. these tannoys that were sort of dual concentric. So they, they had one giant bass speaker and one tiny little uh, HF driver. And they sounded like they looked. It was kind of... <laughs> Yeah, and I you, I used to hang out with the guys at three hundred one, and I'd go into Don's room, and Don had a pair of um, JBLs, which were famously very mid rangey and and bright, mm. but they sounded good in his room, and I was like, and even the bass, and I was like, I can't hear that in my room, like, you know, your room sounds good, and funnily enough, I always thought that three hundred one room sounded pretty okay. He had a pair of Duntex in there at one stage, and. Again, with Duntex, you know, there are all these things like, oh, you're meant to sit, you know, 8.2 kilometers distant from them and have them <laughs> at this angle. Don had them like a giant pair of fucking headphones. Wow. And they sounded good. Wow. You know? Um, yeah. I le Look, I, I had a similar experience to you, I guess, in the sense that, you know, people would, would play me stuff from America and say, you know, it sounds so good. How do they do this? And I'd yes. be like, you know what? I don't know. Mm. Um, and so I'd try things. And 301 had stuff. And I used to hang out with those guys. And every so often, you know, they'd sort of say something about something and I'd go away and think about it. Or they'd give me a few breadcrumbs. Mm. But very early on in my career, a guy called Tim Poles, the drummer in the church, mm. Um, I, I compiled an album that he worked on, but he got, got it mastered at 301. And he said, well, why don't you come in and see what they do? And I sat in with Don and Don just had this baffling fucking setup with millions of patch cables. And 
you know, I could hear what was going on, but I, I, I had no idea really what was generating it or causing it. Every single movie made, it was like, am I imagining that? Or did yeah, that? Like, yeah. Yeah, it was complete fucking mystery. Yeah. Um, but it, it was it was very interesting. And, and he and I sort of used to hang out a little bit. And Steve Smart is another guy at 301. And uh, now Ben Feggins, you know, I, yeah. I hang out with him. And Steve, one of the techs, I used to hang out with him a lot. Mm. Um I mean, it's a pretty I mean, small community, isn't it? The mastering community in Well, Australia. the funny thing was, like our old boss, uh, God rest his soul, uh, he used to say, you're not allowed to hang out, you're not allowed to fraternize with the competition. Right. And pretty much everybody just seemed to, I don't know, abide by that. Whereas I was like, well, A, I did work experience at 301. Mm. Um, and B, a friend of mine, Dave Macquarie, was working there. Mm-hmm. And so I just used to hang out with them. I just yeah. go to the pub. It's like we're all in the same game. We've all exactly. got different clients. Like, what does it matter? You yeah, know? <laughs> it was good. And you know, you'd be learning from good. each other. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's it's a funny thing. Like Oscar, um, who used to work there, um, he said to me that sometimes, uh, you know, clients would bring in something that I'd mastered and say to him, "Can you make it sound more like this?" And the funny thing was, at the time, I just didn't believe him. Hmm. Um, but Years later, I kind of realized that we were influencing each other. It wasn't all just a one-way street. Like, originally, I just yeah. thought, I'm the retard. These guys are the geniuses. Mm. And all I'm doing is just trying to catch up desperately, you yeah. know. Um, but the funny thing is, like, Rick O'Neill and I were doing things uh, kind of differently in some ways and using very different methods to do things and being very creative because we had a lot less gear than they did. Mm. Um and so, but then again, in a way, do you need all the gear as well? Yeah. So it was a good, good test for us in a way to, to learn like that. But I hope I haven't just drifted off topic. Too no, much. not at all. I, I, that's really interesting because um, so many of us, our first experiences are working with minimal gear and it really yes. is testing your imagination and honing your skills in probably a, a far more comprehensive way than if you've got every tool under the sun. Well, you know, what happened to me was when I started, so I started pretty young, uh, at the age of about 15, maybe 15 or 16, I had a, a, a job in a nursing home and I lived at home and I was still at school. Mm. Um, and I worked two nights a week and one Sunday morning shift, which was a fucking killer, <laughs> 6 a.m. to something. Oh, God. But I earned $100 a week. Wow. And that was, in 1981 or whatever, that was unheard. It was incredible. I was mm. the wealthiest person I knew. <laughs> well, I had more money than my parents. You know, they were scraping wow. by, and I had $100 a week. And I, you know, they didn't even ask me for rent or anything. I mean, I was still a school kid. Mm. But what I'd do is I'd save up. I'd go 800, I'd save for eight weeks and I'd buy a four track. Wow. And then I'd save for six weeks and I'd buy a mixer. Yeah. And so I, I ended up with a, a, a sort of a Tascam, well, a TAC 3340, which is the four track tape machine. Mm -hmm. And I also had... Yeah, you know, I bought it almost by mistake because I didn't know what I was doing, but I bought one of those cassette-based four tracks yeah, as well, yeah. which was so shit. Yeah. This thing called the Yamaha MT44. Yeah. It was a shocker. Um, but I recorded, and I was playing drums. I was, you know, I was obsessed with music, and uh, but I was recording bands at school. And um, oh wow! Well, I went to school with a guy called Simon Day, who was the singer in a band called Rat, Rat Cat. Cat, and they yeah. had a bit of success. And That'd I recorded great. their first EP, which was, they were Danger Mouse back then. Oh, wow. Um, so, so I was into it young, um, but I never had a compressor, but there was EQ on the desk. Mm. And so, and then when I went to the second studio, the one where I used to work with Dale, um, they had a, the, the only compressor they had was a thing called a Yamaha GC 2020, which mm -hmm. I presume is Gain Control 2020. Yeah, yeah. You'd plug it in, it was hissy, it was fucked, and I just went, compression doesn't work. Yeah, And I right. did everything with EQ. But in a way, it was like I was some sort of blind Willie McTell of the EQ world. <laughs> because, you know, I did a... a it's funny, I, even just a few years ago, I did a single for Richard Pleasance, um, and he said to me, I just love the way you use your compression. And 
I, in all honesty, in complete honesty, mm. I hadn't compressed it. Wow. I'd only EQ'd it. Wow. And so what I think happened to me with that was that <laughs> I became very sensitive to, I suppose, maybe when some frequency areas masked others, and I, I was able to sort of get separational clarity purely through EQ. Whereas mm. Rick O'Neill was like a massive compression guy. He was like, every box has a sound, learn what the sounds are, mm. and you can use it to your advantage. And, you know, I fiddled around, I tried. It, 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 in the end, what I was doing was just, I was adding compression in a side chain so I had complete control of how much of that color to add in. Mm. But he would put compressors over the whole thing and be happy about that. Mm. And it took me a long time to, to come to the conclusion that that could be really good sometimes. It could be great, in fact. Mm. But, um, but yeah, EQ, was, it was like, it's like that's the first instrument I learned, I guess. And I still... Mm. <laughs> Fascinating. Every day, you know. So would you say that you fell into the mastering game or was it yeah. like a lightning bolt that you fell in love with it straight away? Uh, so I, I thought, uh, I guess, I thought I was going to be like an engineer. I, I, look, I, I certainly didn't have the ego to think I was going to be a producer, um, but I loved recording and I loved mixing and I loved sound. I mean, I used to go around the op shops and buy up the old tube... Uh, tape recorders they were mm -hmm. just like usually mono but a you know, maybe a stereo one mm. but generally mono and i would make tape loops and in my bedroom i had loops of tape that went that stretched for fucking miles i mean we wow. had weights and bent coat hangers my brother and i and things that would go around and then i would on i would record these tape loops to the four track so i had things like and i'd slow stuff down i had different speeds so I had a recording of some crickets that I'd done on my little Walkman mm. and I, they were slowed down to half speed, quarter speed, eighth speed and sixteenth speed. And at sixteenth speed... It's crazy. It sounds like a like choir. like humans. It was incredible. Yeah. And that little thing that I recorded ended up on one of Dale's ambient albums. Wow. Um, so I thought I was, you know, maybe sort of a, a co-conspirator musical type person. Mm. Um, and what happened was that the studio that I worked at, I mean, I worked there for free for, I don't know, a year and a half, maybe even two years. I'm not even sure, really. I think I, st I st okay, yeah, I can probably work it out. I started when I was 19 and I went to festival when I was 23. So I probably did two years for nothing. And then the last two years I got paid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's how keen I was. And, and, uh, yeah. and so, but that's what I thought was happening. But a, a different guy bought the studio. B, I became diabetic, um, or I was diabetic by then. Mm. Uh, and that was a little complicated. And the hours were really all over the shop. Mm. And so I, I actually left the studio. Like when you're young, you know, you're just like, oh, I'll get another job. Mm. Uh, thinking that perhaps I would, but being prepared to work in a chicken shop, which I'd done before. And uh, my brother's girlfriend spotted a job at festival that said uh, audio operator. They were very cagey about, you know, wow. what it was. <laughs> and I went along and they, uh, or I phoned them up. That's right. I phoned them up and they said, mate, the, the guy that you need to speak to has just gone on holiday <laughs> for four weeks. <laughs> I mean, it's so festival. They advertise the day the guy goes away. <laughs> And I was just told, you basically had no chance. Like, what do you think? Yeah, we've, we've had 10,000 phone calls for this job. Mm. And, um, and uh, literally about maybe two or three days later, one, one of the guys at the company rang me up and said, look, it's not the job that you're going for, but there's a job. We need somebody working on the floor doing the uh, tape, tape machines, you know, like uh, tape duplicators in mm -hmm. the factory. And he said, it's a foot in the door, blah, blah, blah. So uh, I went, okay. And it was really weird having a full-time job. Like I just had such flexible hours and suddenly bang. Mm. And I was working the night shift. So it was three in the afternoon till 11 at night or the afternoon shift, I think they called it. Because uh, I think they had three shifts at one point. But anyway, I was only on these these upright machines that wound tape into bodies and you just were like a little robot doing all this shit. Mm. And, um, 
and they obviously figured out that I seemed to sort of be a bit more cluey than the other kind of people there who were like, you know, tourists just, you know, getting the job for while well, they yeah. were traveling around yeah. the world and stuff. And so I got this sort of promotion pretty quickly onto something called the loop bins. Mm -hmm. And the loop bins was way better. <laughs> so all the, all the little uh, winders, they called them, that were having the cassette tape wound, wound on this giant pancake that would eventually then end up in a cassette body. Right. They're all being fed by a bigger machine, a half-inch machine, <laughs> that just had the same album going in this massive loop around and around and around. And at the end of the recording of the whole record, they cut a hole in the tape mm -hmm. and there was a kind of a boom that was made. And the machine had a sensor on the winder and would cut the tape at the end of every recording of the album. Wow. So this pancake, this very thin cassette sized pancake mm. would have about, I don't know, maybe five or six copies of an album on it. Like it was huge. Yeah. The loop bin though, they'd go, okay. Clean, you'd clean the heads, you'd load in a new master. It could be, I don't know, the best of Kamal, mm -hmm. you know, 30 golden showers or whatever. And um, greats, I mean. And, and then you'd, you'd tie the ends together. You'd hit play. And this, this thing would uh, create all these copies onto these pancakes, which then the people on the winders would do. So once you got going, you could sit down and have a relax. Now, obviously, if something mm. went wrong, you had to be, you know, right on it. But um, so I got I got onto that. And then I don't know whether I'd had any other major interactions, but I think maybe I'd solved the problem or something. I'm not, I can't really remember, but I just remember when the guy came back, weirdest job interview I've ever had in my life. <laughs> I asked him all the questions <laughs> and only because I was curious. Yeah. Like I was like, you know, how much vinyl do you do? Where's it? Where do you see, you know, CD, a big thing, where's it going? Like, I don't know. I was just curious. I just, hmm. And in the end, I think he just went, oh, well, this guy seems pretty keen. Yeah, he's interested. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so he, came, he just came into the factory one day and said, welcome aboard. Hmm. And, um, and then I think, yeah, I was shown. So I started in what they call cassette mastering, which is a massive bludge. Um, you would just literally copy things onto that loop bin master. I told you, you were making a loop bin master and then somebody else would deal with it. Yeah. And every so often they just got chewed up in the bin or there'd be a new release. So you made one copy from a master onto this half inch for the loop bin. Mm. So you could do three albums a day. Mm. They thought that that was a day's work, but it was like three times 45 minutes work. Mm. <laughs> it was mm. nothing. So I did things like I carved chess sets, I wrote poetry, I did a lot of drawing. <laughs> but the good thing that they had also was if you want to be trained in any other area, we'll do it. So I was always in the cutting room hanging out with Warren or Rick mm. trying to find out about cutting. And within three months, I started cutting my first records and they would just leave you on like say catalog stuff. So, mm -hmm. you know, the best of Credence Clearwater Revival, you know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And there was an old lathe and there was a new one. And the new one was, was the VMS-80. It was a brilliant lathe. It was very hard to, to do a bad cut on that lathe, really. Mm. But the old one, if you could get a good cut on that, that was very good training for riding in the Cadillac right. next door. Yeah, yeah. You know? so, that, so in a way, I fell into it because I was still recording while I was working at a festival, still mixing, doing stuff for other people but I just found mastering was very interesting it was really not even so much CD stuff which back then it was just everything was about the vinyl yeah and then the CD was almost like a copy of the vinyl master mm. but to get a good uh, reproduction and then it would go down to the electroplating bath sometimes the bath would crash sometimes you had to cut records over and over again mm. and in a way that was actually Although you thought it was frustrating, sometimes you had an idea about how to make it better each time as well. Mm. Um, so it was this very long, slow process. I mean, do you remember the first project yeah. that they threw at you that you felt you had creative input into? Hmm. 
Well, I would because say... Because I'm assuming from what you're saying that all of this stuff, you, you don't feel that you've got any real creative say in it. You're just making copies at this point and learning how the lathes yeah. work and stuff well, that, like that. That's kind of almost the way they did it. Yeah. But um, When did that change for you, do you reckon? That changed for me with the hard-ons. Uh, okay. So they had an album... It might have been Yummy. I can't quite remember. I think it was maybe Yummy. And not mentioning any names, but other other employees mm -hmm. who were more sort of senior, shall we say, than me, had cut the album. So so just to backtrack, mm. the Hard-Ons were signed to Waterfront. Waterfront did everything at 301. Mm -hmm. And then Waterfront got signed to Festival. And Festival went, well, you're getting it cut here at festival because yeah. we've got a cutting room we're not paying for it to be done through a one yeah anyway they so they got their test pressings back or whatever and they weren't happy and so there were a couple of attempts to cut it and um they wanted to go to 301 because they'd been there i think they'd worked with leon and everything was great and you know there's just no problem they just they'd never thought of this stage of the of the process as being you know tricky or whatever mm. and um and the A&R manager, bless him, a guy called Kerry Fitzgerald, um, he's still around. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to make it sound like he's shuffled <laughs> off. But um, he said, well, we've got this one young guy. He's untested because I'd never done, like I, at the studio where I worked, I'd done loads of sessions with strangers. Mm. People walked in, bands I'd never met before. I did tons of stuff. But at festival, it was like, that was what they considered. I think they called it custom work or something like that. You know, foreign work or something you know like right. aliens you know not not hmm. stuff within the company hmm. and um and i and as far as the company were concerned i had i had never worked with an alien before you know i'd never <laughs> worked with a, a foreigner hmm. and so they said look try this one young guy if it doesn't work out no sweat at all you can go to 301 we'll pay for it but just give him a go and so ray and blackie came in and it was you know kind of complex music in a way because it's very fast mm. and it's quite sort of aggressive yeah, Ray's bass yeah and the drums are unbelievably fast Blackie's guitar is like Wah. um Kesha's vocals were probably maybe the most consistent thing in it Ray's bass is like pretty frantic mm. and and they sort of said you know we just want it to be exciting and blah 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 and I don't think I'd even really heard music particularly much like that before either mm. and so I just kind of mucked around and did what I thought sounded good and they got it home uh, and they really liked it. Like they, they loved it in fact, apparently. I mean, I didn't really hear any of this. I, all I heard was that it wasn't a colossal failure. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and it, I guess in my mind, you know, it, it, I'd heard that in some ways I'd sort of saved the ball a little for festival, yeah. you know, in a sense, you know, that was about, yeah, because it was not like they, you didn't grow up getting like tons of praise, like, oh man, you know, fucking, you aced it. It was just like, yeah, yeah, no, they're going with your cut, it's okay. Yeah, you know, right, like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, that, and so, but that put me on the map because then they went, well, he can work with strangers and he can make them happy. Mm. Um, but back then, you didn't have to work with many strangers. Like most of the stuff that was being cut was all catalogue, you know, so all the best of, you know, whatever and, you know, stuff that had already been mastered overseas. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I owe a great debt to those guys in a way because, um, well, I'm still working with them, you mm. know. I mean, that's... Isn't that uh, amazing? When was the yeah, last time you listened back to that album, the first one you cut? Ironically enough, not that long ago because I had to do the, the vinyl reissue for it. Oh, wow. Um, so, so only... only uh, only, um, yeah, f uh, probably two months ago. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> yes. I'm, th yeah. I'm fascinated. When you listen back to it, yeah. first of all, d did it take you back to that time and place? And secondly, did you like what you did? Um, yeah, <laughs> strangely. Yeah. Yes and yes. Um, it, it, it is odd how, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a really strange thing, but I think in some ways... And maybe it's, it could be a sort of a certain amount of Aspergery stuff that maybe musicians share and maybe mastering engineers a bit. Because I, when, I, when I went to the, uh, the ceremony, shall we say, in, the, in America, <laughs> um, I, hang out, I got to hang out with a guy called Chris 
Geringer from Sterling Sound, who's you know unbelievably famous. Yeah. And um, and his girlfriend said to me, "Oh, he never forgets anything. He 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 once he's heard it, he can't." You know. And I was like, "Yeah, you know, I, that's the thing. Like, I always thought I had a shit memory, right? Mm. But I but I don't really. And 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 what I realized was that I had an incredible memory for. I mean, you've heard. I suppose I can you know do mimicry and stuff. Um, yeah, very but I, well. I had a memory for, yeah, I had a memory for tones and sounds. And like one day, <laughs> these guys came in, and um, and we were, you know, they're playing me the mixes that we were cutting it or whatever. And I and I put it up and I went, was this mixed on a Pro Mix O One? And they were like, yeah. And then later, years later, I saw this thing saying, this guy he heard our mix and he knew what it, it had been mixed on. What a fucking freak. <laughs> and in a way, I could certainly understand that yeah. interpretation yeah. because that's actually quite fair. Yeah. But the secret, the way I you know, understood it was I'd actually had a Pro Mix 01. And so I recognized the tone. I recognized what it did to the thing. Yeah. And it was a bit similar with like Rick O'Neill and I used to laugh about... Um, if something was mixed through an SSL compressor, because, you, you know, it was quite a signature. Mm. You, you really hear it. And, um, yeah, I guess the biggest botch, well, it's not really a botch, but um, somebody sent me something. Uh, I can't remember whether I was supposed to remaster it or use it as a ref or whatever it was. And I listened to it and I went, oh, okay, it's mastered at Sterling Sound. And I went, you know, it's kind of really like Greg Calby, but it's just not quite Greg Calby but it's really similar to Greg Calby and and so that was as far as I went mm. <laughs> mentally mm. you know and I said to the person it sounds like a Sterling sound master and they were like that's fucking incredible blah 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 and I said who mastered it and you know who mastered it Greg Calby's assistant wow I was so close wow and I just chickened out I, like I didn't make that leap of intuition yeah you know yeah now i'm not saying i'm unreal it's like no if you do this every day like my old carpenter sammy i, don't, I think you might have met him you would Maybe. you would hold up like a, a mug mm. and you'd say how tall sammy and he'd go 67.3 beer and then you'd <laughs> get out the fuck you know wow. what it was unbelievable man unbelievable wow. he was within a millimeter nearly every time wow Amazing. It was just extraordinary. So, so do you think, um, yeah. it, it, what what do you hear? And I should have taken that MP3 test. I never did. Yeah, you should. <laughs> Absolutely. I and should, yeah. That's still on the agenda. Yeah. Do you? What do you think you can hear that the rest of us don't or can't? <laughs> um. and, and, and not to big up yourself, just... Literally, what do you, what do you think you hear that that the rest of us don't? Um, opportunity, maybe. Uh, you know, uh, the thing is, uh, the thing is, I think that you, I think that you. Look, I, I think I know people with better hearing than me. Abs in fact, I do. Mm. Like, who can hear more high frequencies or mm. hear what somebody's saying in a party in a room. Uh, it, you know, it, again, it's it's the same. I would come down to the same thing with the room, with your ears, everything. It's like if you if I said to you, Michael, I've always wanted to be a good songwriter, and you went, man, first thing you got to do is buy a two hundred and fifty grand Les Paul. Yeah, that would be my suggestion. This is what we, yeah, this is what we're talking about. It's like yeah. everybody goes, you must have incredible hearing, and it's like I don't. Yeah, I don't think. You know, I think uh, what I have is. I don't want to use the word incredible, but mm. I, I, I would have a, an ability to imagine what I could do with the sound. But even then, that's limited because uh, I was talking to a client today, this guy, Daniel Flynn. Mm. Um, I did an album for him uh, at my previous studio in Tassie, around the corner. And it was the most miraculous bloody album ever because the mixes were really not that great. They were all over the shop. It was a fucking, you know... It was talk about dog's breakfast, mm. really. The songs were good. Mm. Um, and somehow, and, and it amazed even me, mm. that record came together so well in mastering. He's even still talking about it. Because mm. I did another album after that, which had much better mixes, 
did it have the same vibe? Like, yeah. And and I, to be completely honest, I never imagined. Even when I heard it, I was like, oh fuck, fuck. Mm. You know, this is. So there is a limit to your imagination, and 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 what I think, if you, you know, clever about it, you fill that in with a bit of experimentation. Mm. You know, so uh, you know, again, it's going to sound egotistical but it's just to illustrate the point really but you know I was at a mastering uh, forum and the question was asked you know when you hear a mix for the first time can you imagine what it could sound like mm. and everyone said yes yeah and they said you know or it was like do you have a sound in your head that you're going for and they went yes 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 yeah, yeah. and and I was the only one <laughs> yeah. who said no yeah it's like I sort of imagine what I can hear, but I am beyond open to happy accidents yes. on the way, to doing it three or four different ways and seeing which way I like. Like I'm not a, a I you know, it's it's not a case of self belief because I don't know, for me it's all a journey. Yeah. Like the track shows you things, it shows you what you can't do with it. Um so so you could maybe imagine in your mind even a better drum sound than you can get. Mm -hmm. And so I, I feel like there's a certain thing of human hubris in this idea that I hear it, you know, I don't want to denigrate the other guys. They're all amazing. But yeah. I feel like th I went through that stage some time ago, but it's probably because I'm wired a bit unusually. And and I know like everyone says that, but I I am actually a little bit, unusually wide i've got a thing called sensory processing sensitivity i don't know if i've told you about no. it but okay well look it's it's a <laughs> you'll love it it's a mental disease <laughs> there's there's nothing there's nothing physiological about it apparently isn't that great yeah um it's a thing where you process sensory data uh, more deeply than normal people so for example me getting in and out of hot showers mm -hmm. you know getting into a cold bed um you know w it was so funny we were talking to my mother about it because when i was a you know, young child we used to make mud pies but i was forever washing my hands during the creations of these things the the grit underneath my nails i could barely tolerate mm -hmm. you know apparently i was wringing my hands all the time as a child as well and she and the thing was, my brother is, you know, pretty autistic. Like, he's a rain man. Like, he would read cricket stati statistics books and, you know. Mm. And and I always thought I was, like, pretty normal. Mm. And, yeah, but my father's very unusual. Like, he lives in this world of physics. Mm. There's something a bit odd about the bounds. It's not so crazy, but I guess what I kind of realized was that in some ways, if you do have something like that... Um, there are benefits and, and deficits, you know, and I, I, I wouldn't necessarily, you know, wish it on anyone because it can be pretty uncomfortable at times. And, you know, friends are like just off the cuff, let's dive in the gorge and everything. And I'm like, if I go in there, it will almost be like I'm going to have a seizure. Wow. Like you guys don't understand. You really don't. And, you you know, and, and it, the thing was, Pill, my ex uh, wife she used to just laugh and say what's wrong with you you mm. know like stop twitching like whereas you know Marnie actually went I think we should look into this mm. and it reminded me of when Gary Newman he was finally diagnosed as autistic and he was like oh it's such a fucking relief totally now I know ev totally I know everyone talks about this stuff because it, it is quite you know it is quite common but but it's also me, quite recent yes and you know what unbelievably helpful yeah it, it, it actually reassured me that I'm 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 not just making it all up or something I don't know but to in such a long-winded way but to get back to your question I think maybe that might be a part of it too like yeah. there's something about the way I'm processing you know because see this is the thing you you've said to me in the past you're the em emotional mastering engineer yeah and I actually think that's kind of what I'm really, really trying to do. Mm. And maybe I always have, and I, but I haven't even known that myself. Mm. Um, oh, that's what and that's always struck me. It's a harder thing to quantify, yeah. you know, because you, you, I know guys who are, uh, you're technically 
brilliant, you know, or guys who play with distortion in such interesting ways. And I mean, I kind of do a bit as well. But but again, you know, obviously the ultimate thing is the actual song, mm. isn't it? Yeah. You know, regardless of you having fun. Yeah. And I do like to have fun. I mean, I, I uh, yeah, I think I think it's having fun as well, like staying young at heart. Yeah. And, being you know interested you know i think you and i are very similar like that and very lucky in that we still have as much fun with this as ever it's incredible yeah i know yeah and th i suppose i mean you look in the mirror and it's a bit of a shock but yeah yeah exactly. but when you're in the zone yeah. you're just you're just back to like when you were you know i mean i'd be doing this for nothing if, if people didn't pay me, me too. You know? I'd just be ringing up friends going, yeah, got anything to send me? I'll, I'll have a play with it, you know. I know. And that's got to um, put us amongst the luckiest people in the entire world. Look, it's an extraordinary thing, well, A, to be able to work in music. I mean, because it's difficult, yeah. as you know, yeah. you know. Um, but to be able to survive in it for longer than mm. five minutes yeah. uh, and to, to become sort of notionally in some ways good at it but it's it's you know like you can never turn your back on music it's no. just every day there's something you know going yeah what do you think of this and it's like what i don't i don't know i in, you know and in a way i think also cultivating a beginner's mind uh or maybe just by default always having one yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> in my case yeah, you know? me too um yeah but I, but i do think you know uh I, th I do think that's something we share, mm. you know, and you're always experimenting. You know, no two mixes are the same. Mm. There's no Michael McGlynn preset. No, that's the thing. <laughs> I've, I've never had a sound. No, yeah. no. And I like it. You know, I, like I, I, I think it'd be I boring if I made I the same a... record over and over again. Well, I, d I didn't think I had a sound, but I got a bit of a shot across the bows with um, the tenants, you know, who sent me stuff that I'd mastered over a period of, 15 years and I they said you know do a compilation you'll probably have to tweak it and I put all the tracks in and they all sat really well wow. together and I was like oh fuck yeah what does this mean yeah yeah through your but whole anyway. existence into question it did it did yeah. um so if we if we uh, fast forward from your humble beginnings sir and yes. we get to <laughs> uh your grammy win I'd like to talk about that if that's okay, because I think it's interesting. No. Okay. Yep. I'll. I'll. You'll I'll, take I'll, the bait. I'll play the ball. <laughs> Thank you. So. It, well, look, it, it is a mi it is a mixed bag in a way, as perhaps you'll you know yeah. hear, but that's that's fine. Yeah. Right? Well, yeah. I mean, um, you almost didn't go to the to the yeah, ceremony. No. Yeah. Um, yeah. I was just wondering if we could talk a little bit about that whole experience. Um, so for those that don't know, uh, you mastered Gautier's Somebody That I Used To Know, which one song of the year, and you were on stage with Prince handing you a, a Grammy Award. Um, how do you look back at that whole process now? Uh, uh, look, I'm, gl I'm glad I went. Um, so I think I might have told you how I decided to go, yes. <laughs> which was just so ridiculous. Um, yeah, I had a sort of a golem style conversation with myself going, well, what are you going to go next year when they don't invite you? Yeah. Like I, I finally did realize that this might be a once in a lifetime yeah. thing. And so with three weeks to go, I, I, I managed to get a ticket. But more amazingly, I managed to get a room at a hotel in, in downtown L.A., and everyone said to me, why are you staying in downtown? Mm. And it's like, well, I never, ever thought to look at hotels in Hollywood. I assumed I could not afford them. And, um, and also I thought, downtown, that sounds great. You know, like I'll be in the middle of mm. the city. I didn't realize that L.A. is like this sort of semi-exploded wedding cake yeah. where there's a giant crater in the middle of town and all the money's on the outside. And in the middle, mm. I mean, it may be slightly changing, but... Um, but anyway, look, so I got on, I got on the flight uh, and I might have told you uh, <laughs> that when I walked into the duty-free area, somebody that I used to know came on over the speakers <laughs> and I thought it could be a good sign or it could be a dreadful <laughs> omen. <laughs> uh. but, you know, it's like 
Everything was going so well until they played it just that yes, one that's more right, time. In the duty-free lounge. Yeah. Oh, God, it was funny. But anyway, look, I got over there, and um, L.A. was unbelievably friendly. Like, at, at the airport, there was this party atmosphere, you know, because, uh, I mean, I traveled in the States before, and it was like retinal scans and, like, so serious, no one joking, nothing. Mm. Um, this was like... The Grammys are like a happy time. Well, they were, but I'm sure they still are. A happy time in mm. LA. Although, to to make a counterfactual claim to that, one of the LA's finest had gone postal at the time, and so they were looking under the car, the limo, when I pulled up out the front for bombs. Oh, wow. So, just to give you some context. But anyway, look, I got over there. Um, I met a hip hop guy in the uh, in the lift. I just thought he looked like a musician. And, you know, it's probably like never talk to strangers, especially huge, bloody, mm. you know, monster looking guys. And I just I just said to him, you know, excuse me, but you don't happen to be here for the Grammys, are you? And he's just like, man, come up. Like I could have been going up there to be yeah. shot. But no, I was offered you know, drugs <laughs> and, you know, I was like the best friend. You know, when, when I he said to me, what are you here for? And I said, go to you. And it was like, go to you. Yeah. <laughs> like they couldn't believe it. But this was this hip hop crew. And I hung out with them and they were so funny because they were hip hop people. But one of them was like a top flight music lawyer. Another one was a lawyer as well. One guy who looked a lot like Obama was a dentist. Mm. And this guy in the lift was actually training to be a doctor. Mm. Um, so they were like hip hop in a way, but they were sort of ironically establishment. Mm. Mm. But the music lawyer guy, he knew everyone. And um, so... You know, we hung out, we went to the red carpet. We weren't allowed on the red carpet because my ticket was the wrong type of ticket. It was for an, for an engineer, right. not a, not a right. star. I get in there, they say, what are you in for? I say, record of the year. Suddenly it's like, fuck, they're scrambling. They get me this VIP bloody, you know, uh, limousine pass. Wow. So the hip hop guys provided the minivan yeah. and I provided the thing that allowed us to drive up the front. <laughs> nice. And uh, but then we couldn't go on the red carpet, and they were all very disappointed about that. I didn't really mind because I'm not that photogenic, as you can tell. But um, but yeah, and then the funny thing was, so there's a main kind of hall, and it hadn't started yet, but we were supposed to get there by some particular time. I was, of course, as late as possible because I'd ha hanging around. But Wally and the others were stuck in this other bit which is the non-televised part of the grammys right and apparently it was just like a, a horse auction but they're just going yeah and then the latin record of the year and the nominees are blah 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 blah, blah and the winner is blah 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 and wow. then it was just like and the next one blah 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 and he was stuck in there the poor idiot because he he had some he had some nominee nominations in that right Anyway, so then we got into the big thing, massive razzmatazz. All the artists are down the front. The engineers are like halfway up the back, yeah. you know, like miles away. But I turn around and right standing, sitting behind me is Chris Geringer from Sterling Sound. Yeah. So I've got one nomination in this whole race, you know, <laughs> one. He's got 35 albums that he's mastered all up for something. <laughs> but the only thing he... And, and he's, got, he's got, I think, maybe even two contenders in my category. So he's got uh, Fun was one of them, and I can't remember who the, the other was. So, he, so in my category, there was, um, you know, Gautier, and there was Fun. Yeah. Uh, I can't, and there was, uh, I think, uh, those, uh, I'm a Lonely Boy, you know, those oh, guys. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, Black Keys. Uh, Black Keys, and maybe, yeah, another one that he'd mastered. So he had two shots. In the in the you know the Russian roulette, I had one. Yeah, yeah. But the first thing he said to me pretty much was, "You you you're gonna win," hmm. and I thought I just didn't believe him. Like I thought, well, Americans they reward themselves. Yeah, they're not you know they generally don't. But but I thought if it was fair, then Wally probably should have won because that song was you know a worldwide bloody sensation. It was a phenomenon. Yeah, it was. It was. It it it, it the way it took off. Uh, amaze me, mm. you know, um, and it's so funny because he was. Uh, he asked me if he, if he thought I should drop it from the record. Yeah. If he should drop it from the record, and I said no. <laughs> yeah, good, good yeah, call. That I mean, one. 
Well, it, it wasn't my final decision, but he, he you know, Wally is, is, he canvasses a lot of opinions and he has, a, he's a, good, a real thinker, yeah. you know. Yeah. He sees what people think and, uh, yeah, he's a lovely guy. But anyway, then we were stuck in there for this dog and pony show that went for hours and hours and hours. And then John Watson sort of goes, yeah, well, I've, I've had a look at the other ones and usually they announce it at around 10 to 11 or something like that. And it's like quarter to 11 and it's like 14 minutes to 11. And it's like yeah. 13. And, were you getting anyway, nervous? The, I was a little. Mm. Yeah, I guess. Mm. There was just a lot of tension, yeah. you know, and... Um, and they announced it, and I had I'd taken my, I had my passport with me because I thought they might stop me <laughs> and not, you know, because we had to run half the auditorium. So that's why, if you watch the video, I think I get there before Frank. He's probably a bit out of condition. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and then Wally made the speech, and where we were standing, it was almost like a, an audio null. Like I could hardly hear anything he was saying. Oh wow. And Prince is just sort of, I think he heard his own, own name and he sort of, you know, smiles a bit. And, but, um, yeah, in, in, in reality, he was miniature. He was um, a sort of an elf, uh, you know, poss possibly even the dwarvish uh, offspring of an elf, <laughs> dressed in this ludicrous kind of diamond-encrusted sort of tracksuit with a diamond-encrusted cane. I mean, God Almighty! You know, the poor guy. I don't know. That must have cost him. That get-up must have cost a fortune. Mm. And um, when we got off stage, you know, uh, Wally and and Kimber just got grabbed by the press. Frank and I were completely ignored, and he was like, "Oh no, we're backroom boys. We're safe. We don't have to do anything." Mm. But they were stuck in like this equivalent of these telephone booths, just with this voracious publicity machine wanting to demand answers they they wanted to them to go on jay leno letterman or whatever all that shit yeah. and wally and and um his girlfriend at the time tash just went no nah, this is a nightmare and they changed their flight and they went home early wow <laughs> okay he made his international speech at um either two ser or fbi one of those is that right his speech to the world wow yep, yep. the americans very friendly but obsessed with fame mm. you know it, it's a yeah yeah there's a real unhealthiness there well the thing that really got me and it's probably a bit heavy to talk about too much of it but the, the poverty the dif the difference between the the wealth so we went we went to a um like a pre uh, like a nominees party mm -hmm. and uh you know i where i was staying there was tent city soup kitchens all that stuff and i went into this giant sort of sealed enclosure where they're eating prawns and stuffing their faces and everything and yeah. to be honest i i found it uh difficult yeah you know very difficult in fact that's kind of uh, gross so yeah yeah it certainly grossed me out mm. yes uh so you know i'm, I'm happy i won it's 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 a strange feeling when people are over the other side of the world give you some tick yeah. and then sort of show you a bit of their world, but it's a very exaggerated version of it mm. and give you a big pat on the back and then you pretty much never hear from them again. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and then you have this little trophy going, you know, like I was there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, and look, it probably hasn't done me any harm in my career in a way like you know uh, but it's not like i massively go on about it or mention it or promote it or anything i i still have the same clients that i've always had yeah my my thing is to just try and do a good job and um and and just just try and keep doing that yeah that's it you know yeah i think you can get too hung up on fame i've, I've seen it happen with some of my friends with when they've had some success in music as well and unfortunately that aspect of it it, it's amazing, but it's also quite sort of uh, shallow and ruthless, I think, too, mm. you know. And so they might have worked 20 years to get that one moment. Yeah. And then they, and then they get it. And, dep and it's especially, it's almost bad if they get it when they're really young, too. Yeah. Because then it's like they're in this wasteland, you know. Yeah. And, and look, some are very, very zen about it. it but it's a hell of a thing to, to go through to almost meet your maker 
or, or your dream comes true, but it's never what you think. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And so maybe that's part of life, but it's just, it's a very extreme version of, of um, you know, I, I, look, I don't know what it was like in village life in the Middle Ages, you know, but <laughs> one day we'll different. let you on the hunt or, yeah. 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 <laughs> but it's very big and it can be very sudden for, for some people, I think, yeah. I know, I know that the whole kind of Grammy experience is... I don't know, there's there's somewhat of an awkwardness to talk about it, but do you ever think about the fact that most people go through their lives doing what we do and never get that experience? And do you ever sit back and go, I'm incredibly lucky that I got to go to the Grammys and, and have that dream kind of ticked off? Um, yeah, I, look, absolutely. Yeah. Like it's, 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 you know, I mean, it's a weird thing though, because, you know, you, you get these people, I've seen it since I was a child. Mm. They would say things like, when I was up there getting that Oscar mm. and making that speech, I was the loneliest person in the world. Huh. Or you would hear about the comedian who was depressed, Yeah, you know, yeah. the Robin Williams type yeah. guy, whatever. And so what I would say is it's remarkable that out of what, you know, 7.7 .7 billion people uh, at my monkey on the typewriter, you know, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to downplay it too much because yeah. it's, it's been continuity of effort on my part for 33 years. But the thing is, you know, I talked to Don Bartley about it because, I mean, he said to me, oh, frankly, I'm jealous. And, mm. and, I, and I could understand that mm. because... He was way more famous than me for so long. Yeah. He worked on all the famous records. Yeah. You know, I, I, yeah, this bastard comes along and does this one fucking thing. You know, like, I really, really, really understood. Yeah, totally. What, 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 where, where he, he, how he felt. You know, um, it's actually but, a sign of maturity to admit that to you. Uh, well, he's older. Than sorry, me, so I don't. Mature. But maturity isn't necessarily a. A, a reflection well, look, what of I, what I said yeah well yeah, yeah sure well what look what I said to him was look the way you've got to think about it is I kind of want it for all of us yeah because you've influenced me you know Tony Mance has influenced me Rick O'Neill's influenced me Ben Feggins has mm. influenced me you've influenced me. like everyone I've ever worked with mm. has had some effect yeah on the way I'm looking at things or you know, even if they've, even if they show me not what to do, you know mm. what I mean? Yeah. But I, I felt like maybe it'll never happen again. I really hope it does for someone, mm. you know, um, and, and it, it is a big thing. It's, it's a bit like an Oscar. Yeah. So I shouldn't underplay it too much, but it is, you know, I, there's a part of me that couldn't really like it's, it's Wally's music. Yeah. You know, for starters, yeah. like I French polished it. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Like I, I, I put a lot of effort into that album. The great irony being, almost the least amount of effort went into that song. Yeah, like there were songs on that that. Uh, so Frank mixed that song, Frank mixed um, State of the Art, and a few of the others, and you know. He's a mastering guy who plays around with it. They were pretty loud. They're pretty good. You know, I just did a few little things. I definitely did some things. Yeah. And look, I won it fair and square because he mastered the album. I mastered the album. Wally chose mine. Yeah. So, you know, but Frank mixed and produced the album. Yeah. So, you know, he, and he, the royalties he was getting, I got a one-off fee. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. um, it's, yeah. Well, but you've got a thinking, very shiny you know, statue with your yes, name exactly. on it. Well, two... Uh, Two as a result, um, yeah. Although the other one, you had to buy your own copy of it. What with the uh, aria? No, no. I'll I'll show you. I'll show you the other thing that I got. It's hilarious. Hang on. I'm going to put these down. I've got to put these down. Okay. Um, so this, we were told, because we'd won this, which was before the Grammys. It, this was a cert that we'd win the Grammy. Right. Uh, Ooh. Now, it's. I'll do it that way so you can sort of see it around the right way. No, that's the wrong way around. I know, but it's the Technical and Excellence Creativity Award or some shit. Okay. Well, that year, they'd lost their sponsorship from Mix Magazine. Right. And so, yes, you could win the award, 
But if you wanted a, a commemorative plastic statue, yeah. you had to pay $200 wow. and send it off to this address. So there was that kind of stuff, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the Americans are so funny. Like, even with the Grammy, it's like you couldn't email anything. You had to fax it. Fax. This was in 2013. And I was like, well, we don't have a fax anymore. <laughs> but luckily, the post office still had their old yes. scanner, which yes. had a fax built into it. Unbelievable. It was incredible. Like, we were so far ahead. It's like I used to go back to the UK and they go, oh, we got this cash and go thing now. And I'm like... What, you mean FPOS? Yeah. <laughs> and, and they'd be like, yeah, it's the latest. And you go, it's not the latest. Yeah, yeah I felt like that in, in America. Yeah. Um, it was a, a big culture shock there. You know, you, you could go into a knife shop and they'd be like, yeah, this is the same knife that Doje used to, to kill, you know, mm. whatever. You know, yeah. and you'd just be like, whoa, well, it's not the exact same knife, but it, yeah. it well, you're willing to sell me a ruddy huge knife and I've only just met you. you yeah, know? yeah. It, it's pretty, it's quite different America, you know. Yeah, it's a, it's a wonderful place, but it's crazy. I mean, they're batshit crazy. And it's, it's amazing. Well, look, they, they, I think they might potentially think the same thing about us. I, I think yeah. it's easy to, to judge, but, but to, to some degree, I mean, I, I just don't think I'll be heading back there in a hurry, mm. really. I do. Th I feel like it's a bit unstable at the moment as well, particularly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was it was crazy. But some of the food uh, was was unbelievably good. Like <laughs> it, the portions were ridiculous. Yeah. Three days worth of food. Like they could solve their national debt overnight with sensible helpings yeah. and their obesity crisis. Yeah, absolutely. But the the burgers, the fries. Mm. The pickles. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's, there's some good shit. And yeah. uh, so, having having got the Grammy, did you f perceive uh, a difference in the way that people treated you back home? No. Okay. No, not at all. Nice. Nothing, nothing changed. I mean, my friend Dave Skeet said, the only thing that changed for him was he could say to clients, you know, we should get William to do it, blah, 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 blah. Oh, and by the way, he won a Grammy. Yeah. And they'd go, oh, well, okay, then that sounds good. Yeah. Um, but the great irony is even to this day, um, I'm still largely working with people that I um, have worked with for a long time. Yeah. Uh, I did get some overseas work as a result of it. Okay. Um, but not that much. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, ironically enough, I got overseas work for other bands that I'd done. Mm. Um, so... It, wa it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't just some magic door that opened everything. Mm. But equally, I mean, you know, well, even now, I don't have a website. I got the Facebook page, but, you know, yeah. haven't put a lot on there lately, have I, Michael? You I know, know you, if you, ever. You, you, have, I know I should, you have not, but you don't really need to. I mean, you, you can't keep up with the workload. So well, why I mean, would it, you look, bother? Again, well, again, it's, it's like my old friend Sammy the Carpenter said. It was like, Bill, if you do a good job, you'll never lack for work. Yeah. And in a way, dead right. Because word of mouth, uh, I mean, okay, so what did I do this afternoon? Well, I, I did Bernie Van Til, the next single, which I don't think you even mixed, uh, called Galaxies. No, I that, think was, it was, the other that guy. was that was one on the, yeah, that I didn't do, yeah. Yeah. But I mean, again, it's like, I, I, and I said to her, look, I'm talking to Michael in 30 minutes time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like... Yeah. Yeah, and and in a way it's kind of lovely. Like yeah. that you just you just keep having these connections, you yeah. know, and and very often like somebody will send me something. And I I did something the other day and I said to this guy, you know, did was it was it Jen Mees that recommended me because I'd just done an album with Jen and um and I and I think I saw on Facebook they knew each other or there was some reason I had the sus suspicion about her in my mind and it was like oh no it's this guy Luke Fuller or it was like somebody completely different mm, mm. and um yeah and, and I think also that idea that I think we very much both share is like you're only as good as your last job like you yeah. you know you never let let up no. you know you've got to stay focused oh are you being summoned for dinner or something I sort of am yeah <laughs> Is that long enough or is there, you well, know, if, there, do, I, I can come back. I definitely had a couple of, of questions that I'd love to cover. 
Sure. Do you want to have well, a dinner I, break? Yeah. Can we re re uh, yeah. restart at like eight? Say. Yeah. How's that? Perfect. Is that is cool? that all right by yeah, you? Great. Just something practical for for people that are, are watching or listening. What's the mm. What's the best way for a mix engineer or a producer to present a song to a mastering engineer? I think it's, uh, you know, I'm going to sound like I've got a PhD in the school for the bleeding obvious. But generally what I would say is, um, give me what you think is the best version of the song that you could create. Now, a lot of people, and we've had this discussion and only recently, this idea of, do I put plugins on the master bus? And every so often I get people who go, well, you know, I don't know why they sound like, you know, uh, sort of London cab drivers, but they'll go with that. <laughs> They're like, yeah, well, I had, I had all my shit on the bus, mate, but you've got all that analog crap and it's, it's going to be better than what I came up with. And yet what they came up with maybe didn't sound anything like any piece of analog gear that I had, but they... <laughs> they tweaked absolutely everything in the mix to work with that mm. and then they pulled it away mm. and it's like I don't know if you've ever seen those photos of attractive models before they've had the airbrushing done mm. but uh, you know you see some gorgeous guy or a gorgeous woman and then you see a pensioner and a crone you know now a slight exaggeration but all I'm saying is make your mix the best way you can, then the mastering guy, if there's some massive problem like they go, well, you know, this is, this is more overcooked than Donald Trump's nose, then, uh, you know, you, you, can, you, can, you, know, you can ask them to turn it down or something. Because, again, uh, you know, one of the benefits of the modern technology is it, it's almost like nothing ever gets lost or, di or dies. Mm. The danger is you've got a billion options mm. and you could make... 200 mixes and go which one's the best and by the end of it somebody is simply blowing their brains mm. out trigger warning suicide was mentioned um and uh you know uh that's it but the great thing is you can say look it's all fine except you know smash the fuck out of it or you know what were you thinking with that cowbell it's nowhere near loud enough mm. they can fix it you mm. know? so in other words so, yeah, the be the better. in other words uh mix the song to sound the absolute best you can get it sounding, send it to the mastering engineer, and yep. a good mastering engineer who cares should then come back and say, hey, can I get you to back off something on the master bus if required? I think so, yes. Mm. What, are some, what are some of the most common mix mistakes that you hear as a mastering engineer? Hmm. Well... Uh, classic, I suppose, things, and look, to be honest, I don't really hear them as much now, but I certainly used to get them, would be things like, for example, the drums are really dull and boxy, and the vocal's really bright. Right. And you go, well, the drums are in the center, the vocal's in the center, so it can't really EQ one without affecting the other, and you go, the vocal's too harsh, so you want to turn that down, but then it makes the drums even worse, mm. you know. Um, so... Things where there are vast tonal di discrepancies between elements, that's a classic. Sibilance is definitely still an issue, mm -hmm. quite commonly. Um, I think that will always be an mm. issue. And again, it can be a little bit of an artistic thing. Like, like if, I'm, if I'm doing stuff for vinyl, it's, a, it's, a, it's an issue. Yeah. You know? But if I'm doing stuff on, t on digital, it's a case of maybe I don't mind it, maybe the next guy hates it, maybe someone doesn't even mm. notice it. Like, you know, um, so you've got to use your judgment a bit on that. There's no, you know. Well, we had one of them um, recently where I sent you a track and you said, look, it'd be great if you could back the sibilance off a bit. And that's that's why I go to you because you give me that kind of care that you will, you know, tell me those things. Yeah. Well, um, another one might be, and I, and I suppose, you know, when waves... Uh, you know, were successful, <laughs> you know, now I think, well, that company, that hard to deal with. Yeah, but anyway, I still use um, them. Yeah, right. Well, look, some people do, some people jump through the 1800 yeah. hoops that they constantly yeah. put on you. Um, but anyway, that when they had their, early on, they had a, like a, an imager thing, I can't remember what it was called, 
and people went crazy with yeah. that. And, and, you, and you just ended up with all this stuff that it was too wide, it was too phasey. Mm. Um, again, with CD, you might be able to get away with it if it got played on AM radio and it went to mono and they summed the two sides together, it could be a problem. Mm. Um, but for vinyl, it was mainly a problem. Like lots of out of phase information for vinyl is not good. Uh, it really has trouble with it. So you, you have to watch it anyway. So be um, careful so of, the, uh, of the amount of widening you, you use? Yes, yeah. Tr try and use panning rather than wideners. I mean, I kind of understand the appeal of both. And sometimes what you might want to do is has panning, you know. So you, you delay something by a small amount and you have the direct one and it feels like you've got, you haven't just got something only on one side. At least you've got a hint of it there. But psychologically, because of the distance between your two ears and your usual means of locating directionality. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I often think about this, you know, with sighted people, like they say, you know, blind people have great hearing. True, in a way, discerning mm -hmm. hearing, very discerning. But um, blind people have great difficulty uh, accurately locating the direction that a sound comes from based on the time difference between it hitting their two ears. And the only reason that w sighted people are better mm. at it is because from youth, you hear the thing, you see the right. thing, you make a correlation. Interesting. But if you, if you never have the visual correlation, you might be able to say so much about what that sound means the texture, mm. maybe even the frequencies that you know, sighted people don't have a fucking chance mm. on. But where it's coming from, the, you, you're not so good with the delay between the ears for location. So, it's yeah, it's a funny thing. Most people would never, ever think about that. Mm. Um, I'd, I'd but, never uh, thought about that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's, it's like we've been trained, yeah, trained since birth mm. to... to to see and, and yeah, hear. the correlation yeah, the between is. the two. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so if you're cross eyed, boy, you got mm. <laughs> Yeah, 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 totally. Sorry, I was, I was, um, thinking, I was thinking about the next question when you made that gag. Um, That's all right. Um, I'd say the only other problem uh, well, vocal levels sometimes too high, too mm -hmm. low. Um, and sometimes. I don't get this so much now, but it used to be at one stage, especially hip hop guys, they would be cranking the bass way too much. Mm -hmm. And they'd say, you know, we can't hear it. And is there anything you can do? And the problem was that they had lots of sub bass. It wasn't clear. It wasn't defined. They never had something up an octave tracking that gave your ear a sort of a higher thing to latch on to. Mm. The smart ones carved out space between the kick drum mm. which was often it might have been an 808 kick drum so it had a lot of subs yeah. as well like they were just creating a giant messy cloud all in one area and then going we can't hear the bass man and you're going yeah because it's it's a mess mm. that's why you know so that but i don't get that so much anymore i must admit do you think uh that it's a good idea for artists let's take that bass for example or vocal level, is it a good yes. idea if the mix engineer is not sure that they send you, the mastering engineer, a here's where we've got the mix, we've also done a vocal up and we've done a vocal down, or do you just go, I don't want to know anything about that? Generally, I, I, I kind of go, I don't want to know anything about that. I want you to show me what you thought was yeah. right. And then if I think it's really wrong, then I'll say something. But with um, technology as well, like I just did an album for, I guess I probably shouldn't say mm -hmm. who. Um, but uh, yeah, there were a couple of tracks where the vocal was a bit loud. And in the context of the album, it just, it affected the flow because you kind of got used to a sort of a certain setting. Yeah. And so the, the, the instrument sounded quite big and the vocal was very clear and it sat there. And then suddenly you get to this track. It started with the vocal. And so if you turned down that vocal to match the level of what you've been used to, the size of the vocal yeah. being, if you like, for the previous, then instrumentally it felt so yeah. weak. 
like it was like oh so there's no it doesn't come in and mm. you know so with that i just w i went to the ozone plug-in uh and uh and just pulled the vocal down a bit mm. and i also did a bit of spatial shit and whatever and and some transient stuff and and i got the track up around the vocal much better now i didn't even have to you know ring them and say can you send me a a new mix yeah. um now Sometimes I might do that because I think it's a more elegant thing to do. But these mixes were mixes that needed a, quite a bit of help anyway. Yeah. And I just thought, you know, it, it's almost the case that if I say to them, uh, like I'll have to say to them, can you bring the vocal down 2 yeah. dB? And I'm kind of guessing. Yeah. I'd rather just see if I can fix it myself. Then if I can't, I'll, I'll say something. Yeah. But look, if it was a, a top flight album and it was mixed by somebody super famous and this, that and the other, then I might just say, do you mind if I get a, a vocal down yeah. on that? Because everything else is so amazing. I, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't want to interfere with anything yeah, yeah. You know, except just yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So, interesting. Yeah, yes and no. <laughs> what, uh, what's the most amount of time you would have spent on one song mastering it? <laughs> a day. Wow. A day, a day, For yeah, a day on a single. Now, that actually was quite a while ago, and there was a very, very charismatic but distracting producer <laughs> involved. Um, in fact, I've definitely spent half a day with a few people that you and I probably might even mm. know. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd, and, and look, to be honest, I think in some ways, if we, if we got onto the analog or digital side of mastering now, in the old days with the analog gear, it was a little bit like you had one shot. Yeah. You had to set everything up, then you had to hit play, and you had to hit record. And the way the steak was cooked yeah. through the different grillers that you'd organized on the, on the train, yeah, yeah. at the end, it had to come out and you had to go, it's right on the outside, it's rare enough on the inside, it's the right temperature. Yeah, yeah that's blah, what blah, we're blah. eating. That's yeah, and 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 the, the royal highness at the end had to go ah, oh, just how I like mm, it, you know. Mm. And whereas with digital, you can go. I'll try it a bit hotter. I'll try it a bit colder. I'll try it cooking it for longer in this section and mm. less in this. You like it's 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 a bit more like you're mixing some incredible sauce, and it just has to taste good at the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, um, and but you can go back and you can. You can make the steak rarer again, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then recook yeah. it. So, it's quite it's quite interesting. And but again, I I think that like there was somebody on the master forum the other day saying, you know, how much stuff do you do analog and how much stuff do you do and and they said, oh, or do you just be lazy and do it digitally? <laughs> and I was like, again, this is exactly the same thinking as the JX three P. It's like, yeah, you know, do you just use the JX three P or do you go out and get an orchestra? Yeah. And it's like, you know what? If you're really creative, you'll make the JX3P. It might, well, might not sound like an orchestra. It might sound more interesting yes. than an orchestra. And so I'm not so wedded to analog the way a lot of other people are. Um, but it took me a long time to yeah. um, come to terms with digital. Uh, but in the end, I just, I, I, you know, coming down. So I moved to Tasmania uh, in 2014, mm. I think it was. I, I think, think it was. Um and and so what I would do is I just do all my normal stuff analog, um, but in the background I try to do a digital master and see if I could make it as good or different or interesting. Mm. And then because it sounded a bit different, I sort of got better at it. An album could be a mix of some analog, some digital, and you know it's it's just a subtle change along the way, and no one ever seemed to notice. Mm. But and I I thought it was good, you know, that like you're not hearing the same thing all right. the time. Like even with the analog chain, maybe it could be a bit yeah. similar, you know. Because even one converter has a flavor, you know. Yeah. And so, and so I, I still do that, you know. I don't, I don't do everything the same way, yeah. you know. Well, occasionally I might. It, 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 yeah, it depends. I mean, like a live concert where there's all this applause and it's all like, yeah. If you, if you run it through lots of different gear, then you get to the applause and it's like, <laughs> and you go, oh, what am I going to crossfade there? And it'll phase. Mm. And so, you know, you, there are times when you have to use yeah. the same thing on yeah, everything. Yeah. But it's pretty rare that you have to do that. And, and so, yeah, when this guy's just going, oh, just be lazy and do it digitally, it's like, fuck, yeah. man. Like, if you wanted to, 
you with digital, you could master an album 50 different ways. Mm. You really yeah. could, you know, and, and maybe the first 10 ways are just the order in which you've got some plugins. The next 30 ways are totally different plugins. Yeah. If you had that many plugins, I mean, I don't, but, but you, you could do different EQ uh, or you can run it uh, all analog. And then when you've got it in the box, then do something to it, mm. or you can treat it with some digital EQ or compression or, or things before you even play it out of the converter, then go through the analog chain. Like you've got so yeah. many fucking yeah. options. Um, and I think to say it's lazy, I, I just I just thought to myself, you, know, you don't, well, A, you don't speak digital well yeah. enough, probably, yeah. um, but B, there's a certain a certain amounts still old fashioned, I think, of snobbery about um, about analog. Like, you know, it, if you've got a proper setup, uh, it should all be analog. And I'm like, you know, that's the same thing as saying you have to have a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar speaker system and a half a million dollar room to be any mm. good. And it's like, look, man, I could put Nigel Mansell mm. or, you know, yeah. in a, in a mini. And he would drive better than somebody who drives that Mini every day. Yeah. And I could put Bobby from next door into the F1 mm. and he'll crash it on the first yeah. bend. You know what I mean? Like it's, there could be a kid sitting at home with some headphones, mm. even Apple yeah, iBuds or whatever, right. who's just a fucking yeah, genius. Exactly. And he'll do better than me. Yeah. It's so possible. Like it's just, it's down to a lot of things. Like, you know, they, they talk about, you know, Einstein's, you know, Beethoven's, whatever, like these rare sort of, you know, uh, creative individuals. Mm. But you know what? It's kind of true. Yeah. Like, um, there are so many artists in every generation, but in terms of like luminaries or geniuses, mm. maybe not That's so right. many. I mean, how many other, how many other Elon Musks have we yeah. got? I mean, I know he's a divisive yeah. figure because of Twitter and everything. Before that, they, five minutes before that, they loved him because of the electric yeah. car. That's how fickle the mob is. But, but a guy like that is, is a bit unusual. Um, oh, clearly. You know, I mean, and they're once in a generation Stephen Hawking. kind of people. So you were talking about moving to Tassie. And yes. uh, I, this is a topic that I find fascinating because you went from Festival Records, um, which was a great studio that was purpose-built, I'm assuming, and then you had your beautiful studio in Stanmore uh, at the back of the house, which I know you spent a lot of money on acoustic treatment. And mm. uh, when you moved to Tassie, uh, you didn't spend tens and tens of thousands of dollars on acoustic treatment. And there are a lot of people out there now that are making records in their bedroom. And I was just mm. wondering if you could talk about your attitude to ac acoustic treatment and how to set up a home studio to be its most effective. Okay, well, I guess I'd say there are two things. So the first is because I, I'm in mastering mm -hmm. and I'm not actually recording, that changes yeah. everything because I, I'm not having to have a live mic at any point in time. So if you're recording at home, like with a microphone, any kind of like drum kit, amps, whatever, and you're not DIing anything, then you've got to be a little bit aware of outside yep. noise. So obviously a big thing is to be aware, uh, away from either noisy things or to do some isolation in the room to try and stop, you know, so you don't have an open window, for example, when you're recording someone's yeah. vocal, all that basic stuff. Um, so what I, what I found in mastering was that I, so I went through, let's just say mastering, I went through three mastering studios. So the first festival one, which cost them quite a lot of money, was an American design, but it was a weird room. It was designed for quad it had what they call a compression ceiling. So the lowest point of the room was above the operator's oh, wow. head. Insane wow. design. Stupid. Yeah. You know, speakers at angles up in the corners. I mean, just mm. madness. Um, and then I had a uh, you know, pretty good room, the room that where we did Citizen. Um, and I liked that room a lot. And then the Stanmore room, I was under the flight path, so I needed 
that was absolutely a room within a room. I mean, it was completely yeah. sealed. And you remember, you know, you, you barely yeah. heard the planes. And that was all just so it didn't distract yeah. me. But, but that would have been good for a recording environment because it, it was recordable yes. enough. It was quiet yeah. enough. Um, but then when I came down to Tassie, I just went, you know, one of the things that's been bugging me all these years is that I'll go to someone's house I'll listen to their stereo, and I reckon it sounds better than most of the studios <laughs> I've been in. Why? Yeah. How? What the fuck yeah, is yeah. going on? Like, I'm glad that the public listen to the stuff that we slave over and we think, oh, there's a bit too much, 200 or whatever, and in their house, it just sounds yeah. unreal. And just go, well, what the fuck's yeah. that all about? And so I, I started paying attention a bit and um, just realizing that most people have wooden floors but with carpet mm -hmm. on them, all carpeted, all, you know, and they had windows that didn't really work. They had doors that were unsealed. Essentially, one of the big things was the bass could escape. And in every right. single studio I'd ever been in, it was like when you get on board the aircraft and they close mm. the door and you feel that kind yeah. of, that yeah. pressure thing. And everyone would be going, oh man, you know, there's... Yeah, but they put in the bass traps and all this fucking shit because at the back of the room, the bass was like, you know, it's huge. And so you move forward and you go, yeah, I know you're sitting on the couch. I know you like the bass big, but, you know, just be aware that it's a bit bigger there than it yeah. really is, you know, all this shit. And so the first house that I bought down here, um, the one in the glamorous photos. Yeah. Um, Magnificent house. I just went. Yeah, incredible place. Um, yeah, I wish I was still there. Uh, but that's what divorce will do to you. Um, I, I just went, I'm just going to carpet this room, for starters, which I did. And now the acoustics guys would say, whatever you do, don't put all the absorption in one plane. So they would say, have a bit of cardboard, a carpet and yeah. a bit of wood, have a bit of carpet and a bit of wood, yeah. have, you know, like spread yeah. it all out. That was the idea. But the problem was that I'd go to normal civilian houses where the carpet was yeah. on the ground and maybe they had a, a, a rug and, and, a, and a polished floor and it sounded better. And so I'm, do, I'm doing a normal style listening environment and see how far I can get. I was in a good spot where there was very little traffic noise, almost mm. nothing. I didn't seal any of the windows. Um, I put... Well, you had I, louvered I, got windows these, in there. Yeah, well, I've got these big, I don't know if you're going to be able to see them. See these yeah. big absorbers? That thing there. I don't know if my hand is yeah, yeah. that thing there, yeah. the gray thing. Um, so they're things that we, we made at festival, uh, sorry, not at festival, at, at Stanmore. They're giant absorbers. Yeah. So they've got a kind of a frame, and I think it's, I think it's tontine or rock wool, maybe tontine, I think, mm -hmm. inside. Um, so I've got, where my speakers there are, there are two kind of walls and where my speakers would, would normally hit that wall, I've got big absorption yeah. and then I've got big absorption behind the speakers and then a tiny bit of very light absorption on the walls and carpet and a couple of diffusers that maybe kind of help. But literally I did it all by ear. Mm. And in fact, the weird thing is... so. The room that I did at, at Trevallon, which was the first house, was a bigger room. And everyone said, bigger rooms sound better. You want a big room for mastering, blah, blah, blah. You want, And the idea was that you have the speakers and they're far enough away from the walls that the, the room stops interfering with the sound from the speakers. Right. Now, I don't know about that because I'm in a much small, well, a fair bit smaller room now. And this room sounds way better than Trevallon. Like Trevallon, I spent quite a while setting up mm. and maybe it was a really good learning curve. This room I came in, I set it up in three days. Um, I got the carpet from Bunnings. I mean, I know my gear, I know my speakers, I know what it was meant to sound mm. like, but somehow this room just started sounding like good really early. Wow. And, and I did do some things to it, but it, so again, long winded answer, but I would say, Fiddle around. Yeah. And one of the really obvious ones is 
play some bass heavy material like something that you know sounds kind of bassy yeah. could be hip hop could be anything and if you've got the ability if it's stereo to mute one side right and see if it suddenly feels like the bass changes in a big way in the room now okay it will definitely change a little bit but if the difference between just and not mono don't add them together but just play one side yeah. You can try it with both. If it's reasonably similar, then the good thing about that is it means that you don't have a massive node or a cancellation going on in the bass. Okay. Because bass, you know, they say, oh, you know, below a certain frequency, you can't tell the direction of the bottom end. and stuff. It's like bullshit. I've got two subs in here. I know which one's on. And if I forget mm. to put one on, it's like, fuck, I've broken my head. Yeah, you know? wow. Um, but if you've got a big a node like a you know a it's like a, where things a standing wave where they add or cancel yeah. and you've got that happening with the bass when you've got the two different signals coming in it will behave differently to just one and if the two signals are reasonably coherent great but if there's a big standing wave especially occurring right where you might be listening mm. it's good to be aware of it so that's definitely one thing the other thing i would say is that um Experiment with the angles of your speakers. Maybe consider putting the tweeters on the outside rather than the inside. Nearly all the books, they show the tweeters on the inside. Like, But I don't know, I always liked a wider stereo mm. image and because I felt like I could pinpoint things more easily. And it, it was like having a slightly wider screen. Yeah. Um, but fiddle around with your monitoring and uh, and get some old bits of carpet or some rugs and just put them over bits, move around the room. I mean, the, the, the best room that you can have is one where you can walk around and the sound doesn't change too much, yeah. you know, and that's what I had in Stanmore. I definitely got that there. Um, I've definitely got that in this room. Um, so it, yeah, it means that because, you know, normal people, they don't sit at home right in front of the speakers like you, mm. Uh, as an engineer would yeah. do they're washing the That's dishes right. they're talking they're stuffing their face with a tim tam you know they're drinking designer you know um urine i mean they could be doing anything you know? <laughs> <laughs> speaking of designer urine cheers yeah yeah i think i might be out of my designer urine <laughs> <laughs> um so do you have any real quick uh, DIY solutions for someone that might be in a share house or something that can't necessarily stick stuff up on the walls. What are, what are a couple of really cool things? Like for me, bookshelves and couches and things like that are always handy. Yeah. What else? Couches are brilliant. Uh, also, Venetian blinds, the wooden ones, go to Bunnings, spend, they're not that cheap. Mm. I mean, it might be you know, 200 yeah. bucks, but they're, they're good. They're much better than the metal ones. Yeah. Um, the, the other thing that I've found just for me, uh, so I used to have my main monitors, which are a reasonable size, uh, separate to the subwoofers. And every, every you know, all the wisdom uh, <laughs> was, you know, you, 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 you keep the subwoofers separate because they're so big, they'll, they'll move the other speakers and you don't want any coupling and all this kind of shit. Yeah. But again, oh, and also the idea was that, you know, you can't detect the direction of bottom end. You can't tell where it's coming mm. from. It's like you're a blind person with bottom end. Mm. And I don't know, I instinctively felt that that was somehow not quite right. It is so less directional. Said, it's less obvious. It is. It is. It's absolutely yeah. a lot less directional and less, well, less obvious because you don't have the fine detail to get the timing things in your yeah. head. But if you if you mute one, I've, I mean I've got two subs. If you mute one, I I feel tell. that you know, yeah. you know, yeah. Anyway, so one night I stayed up. Uh, I used to do this thing if I'd get a bit manic, I just I just wouldn't sleep. I I I just go on to the next day, mm. you know. And it had been bugging me and bugging me. This was in Stanmore, mm. and so I put my speakers in a tower, yeah, you know, with the sub on the bottom and the speaker on the yeah. top. And it was pretty good. And then one day somebody said um, on one of these mastering forums or something that they've been trying these little rubber, they're like sort of half half 
spheres made out of kind of isoprene rubber or something, isolators. Right. And they were putting their speakers that they just had sitting on the console, putting these little rubber feet on them and saying it sounded better. Right. And I know that from a festival, we had NS10s, mm. and I did two things. One was putting the tweeters on the outside, mm -hmm. and the other was putting them off the console, but on a thick pad of neoprene rubber. And people would say, these NS10s are the best sounding NS10s. Mm. And I'd go, well, because the tweeters are harsh in NS10s, so put them far a a apart right. so you won't get quite the harshness. Isolate them off the desk mm. so you don't get the coupling, you know, which sometimes, you know, you could get it to work if you had something behind, but we didn't. We, we didn't have a wall behind. We had it on a free-floating yeah. desk. Anyway, so I'd say... Think about getting some bits of rubber and getting your speakers up off your console or your stands or whatever and just see. Mm. Because when I put my speakers on these things, it sounded better. And, I, and I, it took me a while, you know, to figure out why. And I, and I believe the reason was exactly what those guys have been saying in a way, mm. was that the base enclosure was moving the top thing with it. And when I put these rubber things on, there was just a little bit less bloody wobble and a bit more sort of independence. Yeah. And so the imaging tightened. And I went, you know, you hear about cables, you hear about the, like so much bullshit in audio. Mm. But this thing worked. Yeah, and I was yeah. like, wow, I'm glad I tried it because that really did work. And it was like a couple of hundred dollar experiment. Yeah. The other thing I'd say is your headphones, whatever the goddamn hell you think, you're always told... You know, if you mix on headphones, you're a loser or whatever. It's like, no, you're not. You can do a lot on headphones. Yeah. You probably need to know what can go wrong on headphones. Yeah. Like you might have 10 tons of reverb and it sounds unreal in the cans mm. and you put it on speakers and it's too yeah. much. So you've got to learn some yeah. things about headphones, but you can do a lot. And if you've got neighbors that don't like you or other people in the house, get a good set of headphones. And, and the ones that you've got on, I don't know what they are. They're audio but technicals. The one, they're the um, okay. BT50s, I think they're called. Uh, no. Right. I, uh, well, uh, ah, shit, something 50s. Okay, well, the, funnily enough, I've got 50s as well, but they're not Audio Technica. So these are Fostex uh, headphones, yeah. and there's a company, a speaker company, uh, sorry, a, a tweaker company called Mr. Speakers. Right. And these things are giant leather yeah. I don't know if you can see here you know, how deep they are. Yeah. But so I, I just, you know, I just grew up on headphones. They were like my NS10s, the Fostex. Mm. I had the T20s. Yeah, yeah. They started to die. One day I saw these on special, put them on, went, they're too bright in the mid-range. They need to be further off my ears. And so I took a punt and got those things, modded them. And I, it turned out these T50s were very heavily modded. There was a lot of information all over the web about how you could tweak them. Right. Um, but anyway, my tweak was just these... Bigger uh, cups. Bigger cups, and I love them. They're great, you know. Um, I mean, a friend of mine who's is pretty savvy, he came in and said, oh, you should try the Audi something or whatever. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know. It's like I mastered his album. And I, I look, I do a lot of stuff on headphones. I check everything. Mm. I always have a headphone listen to the entire record yeah. once minimum. Yeah. Um, but I'd, I'd say I listen to, to a lot of stuff on headphones, all, all not all day, every day. Mm. But And then the other thing to consider, I suppose, is just a uh, final thing anyway, is different monitoring. Listen to it on your laptop speakers, listen to it on your headphones, listen to it on your speakers. Yeah. You your know, phone. Don't be about it. Yeah, I never do, but yeah, it's probably a good idea. Yeah. These days, sure, it's vital. <laughs> See, since moving up here to Foster and, and not having the mm. studio where I can crank my beautiful event opals as loud as I wanted them. I am mixing probably 70% on headphones now. And it used yep. to be probably 5% on headphones. And yep. I think it's kind of revolutionized my, my mixing. I feel like I have... I've always yeah. used a lot of headphones. Um, I, I, I love them. You know, like people used to sort of say, oh, well, no serious mastering guide mix master on headphones mm. um I, I actually think people have sort of come out of the woodwork i was speaking to my friend tony mance the other day and he said he knew a guy who was saying he does almost everything mm. on headphones um 
I do a lot on headphones. I check everything on headphones. Mm. Um, I mean, I still, I still use my speakers as well, of course. Um, the funny thing is, though, I've realized, so I've got this little pair of shitty ghetto blaster speakers. I don't use those that often Yeah, anymore. right. I used the to old, use them all the, the ones time. That, what are they, Bose or the something? The 101s. Yeah, the Bose yeah, 101s. Yeah. And, and the other day, I checked an album yeah. on them. And, and they were foreign. And I thought, well, no, I remembered that template straight mm. away. And I went, and you know what? That third track is a bit quiet. Ah, so okay. it is good to check. It is good to check on okay. them. <laughs> I should do it more often. Okay. But, um, but equally, I think you can, you can have too many references. Like mm. I, I saw a picture of someone's studio, a famous mastering guy in America. He's got like 10 different sets of speakers yeah. in there. And I'm like, mate, you know. Fuck, that's just ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. Really? I mean, God, you know, it's like, I don't know, how many different typewriters do you need for the novel, yeah, mate? Exactly. You know, it's uh, crazy exactly. stuff. Exactly. Well, my friend, you've been so generous with your time. Thank you so much for chatting. It's just been like a normal chat, only Pleasure. we've been videoing and recording it. Recording it. Um, but um, <laughs> That's yeah. right. We live like this all the time. Yeah, exactly. I always love chatting with you, mate. And um, thank you once again for, for joining me. No problem. 